Welcome to Scouting for Growth. Today, I'm joined by Simon Torrance. Simon is well known across the fintech sector as Monsieur Embedded Finance, and today in insurance too. In December 2020, Simon wrote a very well-known article, Embedded Insurance, a $3 trillion market opportunity that could also help close the protection gap. Simon works with leaders, executives, and board members to create and implement new growth strategies based on corporate venturing techniques, focus on the platform economy and digital ecosystems. We have something common here, Simon. And Simon does so to help large enterprises transform the business of today to meet the needs of tomorrow. On this podcast, I will start first with an introduction of Simon. Simon will also share with us past experiences in telco and finance. We will then drive into embedded finance and insurance. Simon will also share a great example from a well-known Asian insurer. Finally, Simon will share with us top tips to start your corporate venture building initiative. So let's get started. So, Simon, I'm so pleased to have you with me today. Uh, I know you're, you're an advisor, you're working with a lot of digital ventures and a lot of executive within various industries. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and what you do every day? Yeah, well, yeah. So, so I've been a, an advisor focused on corporate innovation all my life, really. And I used to work for big companies doing that. I set up my own companies to do that as well over the, over the years. But um, I've been particularly focused over the last 20 years on digital business models and how traditional companies can incorporate those into their own uh, activities. And uh, so I'm, I'm spending most of my time, actually a lot of my time now in the financial service sector and uh, particularly in insurance. Uh, trying to help traditional companies rethink their business models to be more fit for the future. And so being fit for the future, what does that mean for Simon? <laughs> you know, we talk about business models, you and I, we talk a lot about those business models. That is one of our uh, passion. But what does it mean to be fit for purpose in the digital world we are in? Well, I think the, the, the main problem is that digitization, which is happening across every sector, tends to shrink and contract traditional profit pools because you get new competition, you get new entrants in the market, you often get new regulation, customer expectations increase. And this is for all sectors, by the way. Um, and so companies have got to spend more money to keep up with those customer expectations. And so the old models that were fine in an analog world are becoming under increasing pressure. And so nearly, I mean, every sector, all businesses need and are increasingly feeling that pressure and they need to, to do something different. And what, what I mean by business model is the fundamental way that a company creates value for customers, captures value for itself and, and increasingly shares value with others. So it's a really important aspect of innovation. It's the most fundamental aspect of innovation and most companies find it very difficult to, to do business model innovation because it, it addresses so much of everything that they do. Absolutely. Can I go back to your path to actually start working, talking, becoming an expert around business model innovation? How did you decide to focus on that topic? What got you where you are today? Yeah, well, I, I used to do a lot of work in the telecom sector. This is maybe about uh, 15 years ago. And telecoms is one of those sectors which is sort of, it's a combination of sort of, yeah, very high tech and modern and a bit, you know, a bit like a utility and an infrastructure business. It's got that strange combination of both. And back in that, in that time, mobile was really taking off, of course, and uh, mobile uh, telcos were growing like crazy and so on. Um, but you started to see a lot of pressure on their business as competition started to, to bite um, and new players coming in, the so-called, what they called, the telcos called over-the-top players, you know, the Facebooks and the other digital companies that were using the infrastructure that they'd paid for, 
um, they, they'd funded and were seeming to grow much faster and being more successful. And so I, I got, I got it, I, I started to think, well, what's, why are those digital companies being so successful? And what could say telcos learn about that? Telcos have a lot of power in the market, but they, they tend to be focusing on what they know best, which is creating the infrastructure, not so good on creating services and not so good at actually at creating new types of digital business models. And this is back in the year, in about year 2005, 2006, um, it was clear that the companies that were succeeding most in a digital world were those that were running what are called platform-based business models, i.e. they weren't necessarily creating the end customer products themselves, but they were acting as an intermediary between their customers and third parties that had solutions. And that platform-based business model where you're matching consumers with producers and allowing them to interact on your platform you know, has, has and still is the most powerful business model in the digital world. And so you, you started to see the explosion of, of Amazon and Google and Facebook and in, the, in China, Alibaba and others. And they were riding on the top of the telco um, networks, mobile networks. And the telcos were thinking, well, how do we play in that market? So that's what got me thinking, well, how, could, how, can, I, how can we help the telcos in that particular time you know, learn some of those, those skills and approaches and apply it to their own business. Uh, and so that's what got me into this, the, this new type of digital business model that was proving so wildly successful. Interestingly enough, you know, when I think about my telco provider today, and, you know, I can see telco mobile services being very commoditized and in utility, I do not feel that they always are focusing on the customer. So, so what's your view? What can we learn from your learning before we go deep dive into finance? Yeah, well, well, you're exactly right. So what they, what, unfortunately, what the telcos did, they just focused on what they knew best, which was, char I mean, for mobile telcos, was charging people for using the, the phone for calls and SMSs. Um, and they wanted to control all of the services that they thought that customers would need. What the digital companies from Silicon Valley and elsewhere had really understood is that you don't have to do all, you don't have to create all that yourselves. You can, you can um, co-opt developers and third parties to create solutions for your customers. You know, that's what Apple does with the App Store. And in so doing, it drives demand for your core business, in Apple's case, their phones. Now, the telcos didn't learn the lesson of that, and they have, as you say, they have become commodity infrastructure uh, providers now, and you've got, you know, they're not so attractive to investors anymore. They don't attract the same sort of talent. Um, they've become like utilities, which is what we were talking to them about, you know, um, you know some time ago. And, and that is a threat that many industries face if they don't uh, learn some of the lessons uh, in terms of adopting new, new types of digital business models. Which takes us into embedded. So I would love for you, Simon, to explain to us what is embedded finance, insurance, and what got you into looking at new ways for our industry to build new business models. Yeah, well, I'll answer, I'll answer the second part and then I'll come into embedded finance and insurance. So I, one of my clients a couple of years ago was a big financial institution and they said to me look we you know we, we we've heard about this thing called platform business models you know a bit late but uh, could you help us work out what to do about it and so I did some work with them to, to help them understand what platform business models were how they could apply in the banking and the financial service world and then um, I got really I, 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 I got really interested in financial services I hadn't done a lot of work in it before about three years ago, but it, but it seemed to me that it's so important for the world. It underpins all our you know, commercial and social activity. We, we can't operate without financial services. Yet there was something fundamentally broken with that industry. And the gap between what people need and what they were being given was incredibly wide. 
you know, it's it, there's so many people who are just unprotected, have no insurance whatsoever, as you know, around the world. It's so difficult for a small business to get a loan. Um, people, you know, the, the type of experience that, that I have with my old bank is just light years away from the new banks that are popping up now. And no one's really no one's really creating solutions that look after my financial wellness, um, that help me through my life to understand how I need to save, how I need to borrow, how I need to plan for the future, all those sort of things. It's sort of, I'm just left uh, to access a few quite basic solutions from the incumbents. And it got me to thinking that, you know, this, this, with these enormous gaps, huge numbers of people excluded or badly served by the industry, there's got to be some change needed. Well, that's okay. But then when you look at the actual suppliers, the banks and the insurance companies, I, I, I saw that the, the majority of them, over 50% of the big public, publicly traded companies were making zero or negative economic profit. That's profit after cost of capital. So there's something wrong here. The, the customers are not getting what they need. And those who are supplying it, beyond you know, there's a few that do very well, but the majority not making any profit. So that suggests there is a fundamental business model problem in this industry, which is so important for everybody. So that's why I thought I'll double down and really focus on this sector. And I created a new brand uh, last year called, uh, well, as, which, as you know, called Embedded Finance and Super App Strategies to, to try and address this, this issue. So that's, that's the background to how I got into um, the financial service sector. And then looking at the different business models that, that financial institutions could apply, one of the really hot areas was embedded finance. And I'll just, maybe, shall I just explain how I define that? And we can talk about Absolutely. That. I mean, you mentioned profit and I just want to highlight Simon, that, you know, in insurance, you know, many insurance companies do not make money from profit, as you highlighted. It's all about the capital market and the uncertainty which has existed in recent years means it's been really difficult to predict the high and the lows of how a company makes money. However, I see more and more companies looking at how do we make profit from operation, which we love to, to talk about. But yes, let's go to the definitions. Yeah, so, so, so I mean, I did, um, I did some work with the World Economic Forum about 18 months ago. So, so I, I, I'm a sort of member of various um, executive working groups they have, looking at all kinds of topics, but one of them is digital transformation, digital business models. And I, I help them define, you know, a number of digital business models that any executive in any sector could, could understand and appreciate. And, you know, the simple, I mean, I'll give you this background because I think it may be important. The simplest is where you just digitize what you currently do. And that's what most companies and all banks and insurance companies spend the vast majority of all their time and attention on. 99% you know, of resources and money goes on digitizing, making more efficient and optimizing the existing business model. So that's, necessary but it's insufficient if that business model is not delivering economic profit so it's really important because you've got to keep up with the competition and keep up with customer demands but it's not going to change the fundamental economics of the business but we but we were spending all our money on that and then there are different types of business models that end up at the most sophisticated being those platform-based ecosystem orchestration business models of the big um, digital giants now because they've worked out how to exploit it. And some um, financial service companies like Visa and MasterCard and others that are not traditional financial institutions, but they have mastered the, the, the platform business model. So you've got sort of some who have you know, been very successful with the full platform business model. And then there are various gradations in between. Um, so you get, for example, companies that create just much better customer experiences, uh, solving problems for customers using digital technology, but it's not a dramatic change from the existing business model. And I'd think things like Klarna, you know, in, in, in payments or, um, or PayPal originally. And then you get into more, you know, more sophisticated versions of, of marketplaces and exchanges and, and also developer platforms. 
where you're harnessing third party developers to create solutions for your customers. So embedded finance is almost a combination. It's sort of something that cuts across those different business models. And what it says is that why don't we enable other organizations that are much closer to end users, that interact with them more frequently than we do, why don't we enable them to sell financial services because they have more, more regular interactions, they're often more trusted in, for certain, in certain contexts. And why don't we help them not only sell uh, solutions, but also embed them, essentially use components that we've got to create new types of experiences that make their propositions more attractive. And so why that is possible now, in a way it hasn't been you know, over the last few years is because digital technology, as you know, has become so much more sophisticated and particularly financial technology. So all those capabilities, those products, the data, the underwriting capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, which were locked away within traditional companies are now able to be modularized and abstracted into software, a bit like turned into Lego bricks, which other people, developers at other companies can take and configure in ways that suit them to create better solutions or experiences for their end users. So, and, and this, this, what I've just described happened in telecoms. So now, you know, um, when you speak to your Uber driver, it's through, or you text your Uber driver, it's through a platform that has embedded telecoms in Uber's experience. And the same thing is happening now in, in financial services. So why is that interesting? Well, it, it's, there's big demand for it on one side because brands like retailers or banks themselves or um, the, the digital platforms, the online marketplaces, manufacturers and so on and so forth, they're all looking way, for ways to optimize or develop their business model financial services is a key part of their operations because someone's got to pay for something. It needs to be insured most of the time. But today, that activity happens outside of, of their organization. You know, you buy a car, you get a loan from somewhere else want to help you buy a car, and then you need to call someone else to get insurance. But why not the brand may want to control that experience to create greater value for their customer and you can get a loan from the car company and you get insurance from the car company and it creates stickier relationships for that for that brand in the past you know and those types of things happened to some degree in the past but it was all analog it took it was a big contract negotiations with a bank or an insurer. It took years to integrate their products and services. And the customer really got the same sort of experience, you know, which is not great, particularly in insurance, you know, as they did if they called up their, if they just worked directly with an insurer. And now digital technology is allowing all those capabilities that were trapped within the financial institution to be reconfigured in clever ways by a brand for their end customers to create this the experience that is going to be most attractive for them and this is the key thing this is the big thing that's different is that you have a new set of intermediaries between the insurers and the brands which are enabling this and i call this these are new i call it operating systems these these are these are new platforms or providers that are enabling a brand to do this configuration I've just mentioned, and they orchestrate the supply of the best solutions or the best components, the best Lego bricks for the brand. And this in embedded finance and insurance is the new control point in the financial service industry. It's an intermediary between brands who've got large customer bases, interact with them on a regular basis, and have got an enormous amount of data, which we'll come back to talking about, and the supply, those who've got the base products or the components, the Lego bricks. And 
in, in the work I've just been doing very recently, as we've, you know, as, as you know, there are a growing number of these, um, let's call them operating systems, new types of B2B infrastructure, which are, which VCs, venture capitalists, you know, investing a lot of money in. And it started in banking and um, payments with bank as a service platforms and payment facilitators. And it's now moving into insurance quite quickly. So, so for me, this is really exciting. This is a really exciting market here. Potentially, by co-opting brands who've got large customer bases that they interact with frequently in different aspects of people's lives, we, we as the, on the, let's say we being on the financial service industry can get in touch with those, or we can create components or solutions that are more easily configurable to solve the financial wellness needs of the end customers because we're getting better data from the brands, real, often real-time data, which helps our underwriting and all kinds of other uh, of our activities. And we can start to engage many more people, include many more people in financial services. We can cut the costs, operating costs, in insurance claims loss costs, because we've got this new data and we've got these new intermediaries, which are reducing the friction that exists today between us and the end user. And my, my contention is, and this is the vision for embedded finance and insurance, is financial wellness baked in to the everyday lives of everyone, not just those who can afford it and so on. So financial wellness baked into the everyday lives of everyone is the vision for, I, I, I like to use for, financial uh, embedded finance overall and you can then in insurance you can then sort of create a subset of that and call it maybe more and better protection baked into the lives of the everyday lives of everyone not just rich middle class people like me <laughs> there is a lot you shared which we need to unpack so first you talk about financial resilience for, for the many, not just for the few. And for that, we need to look at microservices. So the experience, the engagement, you know, that ultimate engagement, which is friction free. So no leakages, you know, you can do that from just your mobile internet, your mobile device. And at the same time, each of the macro services is not only delivered by a few, but by the many, you have used the Apple metaphor around just look at what Apple has done with the developer community, you know, by actually enabling people to be part of that ecosystem. Apple doesn't need to do everything, but still today, they are one of the most profitable businesses in the world because they invited others to play with them. Now that requires a very different type of mindset, Simon, which often in the financial services institution, which is very much financially driven and insurance, very risk averse. How do we change mindset? How do we get people to start looking beyond their little boxes to invite others to play together, to build better ecosystem and serve customer better? The one which are wealthy, healthy, but the one who also need the help, which takes me potentially as well to the fact that you have done a lot of work around the fourth industrial revolution. Hmm. Yeah, well, I, yeah, that, so, so how do we make the vision that I painted a reality? I mean, I, I actually wrote a book, I, maybe it doesn't, it may come back, back to front on our video, but it's called Fight Back. I wrote this book a few years ago, Fight Back. Fight Back. Yeah, and it's all about how traditional companies can fight, back about against digital disruption by using new business models and uh, co-opting entrepreneurs. We'll come and talk about that, creating ventures and so on. But really it was about how to fight back against old ways of thinking and acting, to your point, the, the mindset. And it's a very natural thing. If, if you are the boss of a very large and successful financial institution, you have risen to the top because you are an expert, you are one of the world's best at that business model that that institution runs. And the whole institution has been, the whole organizational structure, all the metrics, all the processes are all set up and they've been you know, perfected over time to deliver that business model. And so when you're talking about a different type of business model, 
a digital one where you don't necessarily control the end user uh, experience. You know, in the example of embedded insurance or, or finance, you're not in control, someone else is controlling that, where potentially you are not the only manufacturer of solution, of, of products. You're co-opting third-party developers to, to do that for your customers. Um, you're using software in, in ways, you know, you're, you're essentially running a software business. Those at the top of the financial institutions, that's not their, that's not their experience. And so it's very difficult for someone to learn new skills, firstly, and then secondly, to change all those processes, all those institutional processes, the factory that has been fine-tuned over the years, over analog years, to deliver the certain type of, uh, of business model that it, it was created for. So um, what, what I've come to realize is that the people at the top of big, powerful public companies are incredibly smart, and that, but of course, because they've risen to the top. Um, but, there are, but they're trapped within an organizational structure that prevents them from making the change that they know is really needed or from activating that. Um, now, there are some other issues as well. So their shareholders, uh, of course, uh, tend to box their company into a certain category. So if you're an insurance company, we're expecting 5% returns every year and uh, just stick to that. If you do that, we'll be very happy. You know, we don't want fast growth. We'll go somewhere else for fast growth. You know, so <laughs> you've got some uh, metrics from shareholders that constrain you as well. But, and, and that's obviously not gonna go away until you can prove that you can do something different. But the organizational structure is the key challenge. And structure tends to determine behavior, you know, in psychological terms. If I'm in a certain place with certain metrics, I operate in a certain way. So I, what I came to um, realize, and I put it in the book that I mentioned, is that we need to create a real ambidextrous organizational structure. Because the mindset we can check, we can, these are smart people at the top of the company, and they, they, depending on where they are in their career as well, that's another issue which we'll come on to. But you know, they, they want to be successful, they want to grow and so on. But we need to create an ambidextrous structure. And what that means, ambidextrous means is you are good with one hand at optimizing the core business and protecting uh, and fine tuning that because that's where all your profits lie today. But secondly, you need to be good with your other hand, which is fast tracking the future, creating the future businesses, which will tend to be digital. And that means capital, less capital intensive in financial um, services, more digital, leveraging data in completely different ways, real time data, creating new underwriting models and so on. And everybody knows that those skills are different than the core business that is making all the profits. So we need to create a separate space in which we can do that safely. And the problem up until recently is that traditional organizations have, have, haven't really committed to this. They've, they've done a little innovation, let's call it innovation theater. You know, as you know, you know, you know this very well, you know, we've, we'll create some hackathons, we'll create a little space in the corner of the organization where people can play around. But we haven't said we are gonna create I don't know, five new businesses that could be as big as our core business in five or 10 years time. And that's, that's what I've just described is natural to some of the big digital companies that are so powerful today. They, they tend to do it naturally. They create the next wave of business, the Amazon web services or the next, you know, Amazon video or prime, whatever. But we're, but traditional companies, are not, are not comfortable uh, in doing that. And in fact, the types of business models they're creating are, are so different. They're, as I said, capital light, software intensive, they need different people. And so my, my fundamental realization after all these years of trying to help corporates do, let's call it disruptive innovation or business model transformation, is that if we don't address the structure, it's not gonna change. Or the super tanker just going to take too long to, to turn around. So that's my key learning. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And um, I was reflecting around the work um, we are doing. And as you know, 
my interest is you know helping big company identify best way to first to partner so i'm really keen to allow my you know environment which is the ecosystem digital ecosystem to flourish by enabling that partner with relevant young ventures but also facilitate investment acquisition and venture build and what you are saying right now is you can only facilitate those different models of engagement if a business is able to adapt itself and actually change the internal culture, but also the incentives. Uh, all incentives will not enable a business today to be successful and be ambidextrous. Yeah, exactly. And I say, because people talk about culture a lot, which is exactly right, but I say, create, change the structure for, or, or adjust the structure first, and that will change the culture. Because culture is, you know, where, you know, that's a long-term, very long-term thing. And then if you create that structure, then I'll sort of go into a bit more detail on this, but, but is in the, obviously the optimize the present or the current business model is where you're, you're applying lots of new technologies, new me methods and tools, and you're looking to do things much more efficiently. And that's, that's gonna deliver a lot of short-term benefit if you do it right. You know, I think in the insurance industry that, um, you know, I think we, we can see that a lot of the cost structures are going to shrink dramatically as they adopt new technology. So that's great over there, but that's not going to change the fundamental business model. Over here, this is where we fast track the new businesses. And this needs to be given the same prestige in the organization as over here. It's not a sort of, you know, little thing on the court in the side. And it needs to be governed carefully. So the governance, this is about growth, governance for growth. The governance is, it's not run by someone from the core business because they've got their own interests and you know, metrics and incentives over here. It tends to be governed by the CEO or the deputy CEO or something like that. And they're looking at how these, these different activities can coexist, reinforce each other. And one of the best examples I could always give is Ping An from the insurance industry. And it's the best, ex actually, it's the best example, I think, worldwide of any, set, any incumbent that has really adopted a fundamentally changed its business model. And they, they did exactly what I've talked about. The, the, the boss, who was also the founder, which actually makes a difference because founders you know, tend to have more power than, a, let's say, a caretaker manager. And he said, he looked at what Alibaba and Facebook and others were doing. He said, how do we learn from that? And he said, you know, he spent a lot of time understanding it, which is a key part of the leadership mindset change. And he said, OK, this is in 2000." I think 80 or 90 did this, he said, we're not going to be an insurance company anymore. We're going to be a tech company that happens to have financial service licenses. And that just those words you know, dramatically changed the way people thought. And what they meant tech to optimize the current, but we're going to be also tech to create new ventures. And as you know, they created a whole separate organization that created new ventures. They co-opt uh, third party entrepreneurs, they created equity structures, which would give them the incentives that would attract them. They, they also did M&A in this part of the business as well. And they said, we're going to create businesses which are, which are adjacent to our core business that we can never get into normally. And you know, in terms of they created marketplaces for buying and selling cars, real estate marketplaces, telemedicine platforms, all kinds of things. And those were completely different from uh, insurance or a financial service business. Uh, they now, they're now scaled businesses in their own right, very valuable. And what's really interesting about the synergies with the core is that they drive 40% of the new business of the core comes from those new businesses. Essentially, they created their own channels, you know, because if you're buying and selling cars, you need insurance and financial services. Absolutely. You know, if you're doing telemedicine, all that stuff. So that's one of the best examples what I, of what I talk about. So, you know, the principles being really commit. Well, you know, you make a statement, give it the prestige, create different incentives for the, the talent that you'll need, equity structures, and, me, and make sure that, the, you, that these ventures are driving demand for the core business. Just this is what Apple does with its phone. The, the developers are divide, driving demand for their core business. So it keeps the core business happy when you're making, you know, 40% of your revenues. Hey, that's great. I didn't have to do anything for that. Well, no, absolutely. Uh, and also that you're, but you're also creating an unfair advantage for these ventures by leveraging the assets of the core. 
So that that's one of the best examples I can give. And I, I I'm currently, as you know, I run a I'm running a peer group for um, insurance incumbents at the moment, and I use that example um, for them. And I've used it with other sectors as well. Yeah. It works better with other sectors. <laughs> I'll tell you, and you know why, because insurance, oh, well, there's, you know, if it's in your own sector, there's all kinds of reasons why that's not work. That's China, that's China, <laughs> and, uh, different data. But fundamentally, the, the principles uh, apply. And I, I'm, I'm trying to show those peer group members that you could do this as well. It doesn't have to be, a, you know, it doesn't have to be a major thing you don't need to announce it you do it under the radar okay. don't in fact don't announce it yeah keep it under the radar prove it first and then announce it and that's the problem that i think a lot of financial institutions have had over the last five years they've sort of announced things before it's really proven and then you know the analysts and shareholders and others you know say well it didn't work so don't Absolutely. go back stick to your knitting you know yeah. but i think when you even mentioned ping han you know ping han was i think 130 on the fortune of 500 i think 10 years ago today they are number 29 yeah. and uh they didn't announce it they just went in and de did it right and now we actually seeing the benefit of a strategy which was you know the underground strategy which made them a tech business first because as you said they moved from insurance to automotive to healthcare and to many other industries which we probably don't even know yet you know exactly no exactly and they're they also i mean they really commit to this uh this being the tech company they i think they 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 spend about a one percent of their revenues, annual revenues, on tech on R and D, on yeah. R and D, one percent, and I think it's a big number. And I use that number actually, Simon, in my discussion even with my insurance partners. One percent R and D, guys. <laughs> yeah, and they, oh my god, what? R, and it's tech R and D, you know, as you say. And they they are now. They're I think they're the biggest patent holder in the world for blockchain, you know. So and they're like number. I mean, they're one of the, some of the biggest patent holders across all types of digital technology now. So. Um, and I, but it's, I have to say, and you, and you, know, you know this very well, I, I give this example a lot. And I just feel there's, I mean, <laughs> often there's just this great wave of, of, oh my God, we just can't do that in our company. Um, so it, it really is, it's really a discussion that has to be had with the, the board and the, the CEO really, because I, I, everybody else is sort of, they're, they're, they're trapped in their organizational structures at the moment. So. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it would be great to hear how we move a cannot to a can. And I would love to hear from you, Simon, you know, you, you, you came from telecom, you embrace fintech, finance and you are bringing a lot of that thinking now into insurance for us to realize that it is possible in insurance to address the protection gap and do that with embedded thinking so what has been your parkour and how has insurance felt because we are a risk averse industry yeah. it takes a long time to get yeah. that done. well it's very interesting so i got into as i said i got into insurance you know relatively recently and before i thought it was it's really as a customer all the things that a lot of customers think it's it's annoying it's expensive what value do i get from it i i don't want to fill in those forms and if i make a claim it's a you know, it takes forever and i it, i seem to pay out more money than i get back and that's what i've just described i think is how insurance is perceived by many people and that's people who can actually afford it or access it or even understand it you know, and there's va the majority of people in the world can't even do those those three things I've just mentioned. So I, I my initial, you know, that, that was how I thought about insurance. And when I speak to my family that I'm doing a lot in insurance, they sort of yawn and turn the other way. But as you know, once you get into it, it's a fascinating industry. I mean, it's it is utterly fascinating and it's so necessary to everything we do. And the UN, the United Nations um, Development Program, they, they quite recently, they've said that you know, insurance and other related tools are critical to sustaining life on Earth. You know, we, 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 we've, got, we've got so many risks, they're getting, we've got to prevent them, we've got to mitigate them, we've got to understand them, and we've got to work out how to you know, transfer risk as well. And we're not doing it very well at the moment. You know, the protection gaps getting enormous protection gaps. I mean, off the scale, I, I just, 
And this is what got me interested. And I thought, actually, there's a real noble purpose for getting involved in this industry. I, I just, there were two stats that really, really hit me. Um, that we, we cannot afford to retire. We're all gonna live, you know, we're all living on average older. There's more of us on the planet and we cannot afford, or well, the vast majority of people cannot afford to retire. And the gap between what is needed to retire and what people have, I looked at the figure the other day, it's, it's something like $98 trillion worldwide. $98 trillion is the gap. And it's something we're just gonna leave, a bit like climate change, we're gonna leave to other, I mean, it's, it's in the future, can't think about it now. It's just that, and ninety-eight trillion dollars is global GDP, annual GDP at the moment. <laughs> um, and if you look at mortality protection gaps, it's something like twenty-five trillion in the U.S. So if if you're if someone dies in your family who's the breadwinner, you know you're not you, you're in under a lot you're in a lot of trouble, and government cannot fill that up. So, and in healthcare, as you know, you know. The same thing, some sort of thing. So I, I thought there's a real noble purpose in addressing this. It's not just about how we help the insurance company make money. You know, that, that's 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 okay. That's one thing you can do as an advisor. But actually, we're helping the, the you know, as the UN said, helping to sustain life on Earth. That's quite a nice thing to be working in. So, so I tell my family I'm doing that now, uh, rather than insurance. But um, but that so that's what got me really uh, interested in it. And coming back to your question about what the industry is like at the moment, what, what I feel is, I, and I, feel, I get the sense that people in insurance have the same sort of feeling. A lot of them have been there for many, many years. It's, a, it's an industry that tends to keep people for a long time, as you know, which is, which is good. You know, they, they feel that this is a place they want to work. But I do feel, as you say, they're, it's very cautious and conservative, mainly because they are the, of the business model that has been created over over years and has was successful and the lack of that success is just starting to be felt and I, I mean i just as i said the economic profit figures it's just starting to be felt there's a slow burn here it's, it's still an enormous industry generating significant you know accounting profits but you know investors are less interested at the moment the you know the the, the price to sales um uh, ratios are going down. It's not attracting digital talent in the say, you know, as uh, compared to other industries. It's it was seen as a stable industry. It's now, you know, McKinsey calls it a value destroying industry. You know, so and I, what I'm sensing though is is this great passion for the industry by, by those who work in it, and they're very open when I speak to them about wanting to change things. But there are a couple of problems being trapped within an organizational structure, which, which is preventing them from doing the innovation that I think many of them want to do. And secondly, the limited experience of anything else. So if you've worked as an underwriter in a traditional business, you've never run a software business. So how, how are you gonna make that change? And so you see these grand plans of digital transformation, which are doomed to failure really, because it's gonna be trying to change the, all those things in the core business you know, that, it, it's going to take that super tanker, as I said, is going to take a long time to to turn around and the world will have changed by the time it, it does. So that's that's my sort of sense. There's this passion, there's this um, interest, but we're, tra that, this, we're trapped at the moment. Yeah. Insurance is, as you know, an in interesting industry. I joined it when I was very young for my graduate training and I started working in lots of London and I had a choice between banking and insurance and I decided to go for insurance because I actually like the people angle. Um, I felt that it was an industry who, which actually welcomed people. And, you know, still at the time there was 90% was men and 10% were female female. And still I decided to join insurance. What I think is, was the most fascinating part you actually highlighted is it touches everything. And I was fortunate I was working in fine art. So imagine the beautiful painting I saw every day, uh, the massive diamonds um, that I never thought existed. And you have this other part of insurance which is absolutely fascinating because you can actually see physical beauty at the same time you can see tangible things like building which is less less pretty <laughs> but actually you can learn as you said from um underwriting accuracy and how you manage claim how you take care of customers right and i think we lost that on the way yeah and so many people like me who have been in the industry forever i found other ways to actually learn in my case technology 
um, from other sectors. And I think it's important what you are saying. You cannot grow from staying in the bubble. You need to get outside of the bubble. And the executives which are there need to really understand how to embrace the ex ex external industry. So the executive who are there needs to know how to embrace other industries, but also how to change their operating model, which takes me, Simon, to technology. You know, we are all talking about Web 3.0 and metaverse and all those things, but maybe let's not get there yet. <laughs> how, how technology can change insurance, embedded finance? What can we learn to build the business model which are going to be the most effective in the future yeah i, th I think actually i mean i, I think data is is the key of course because you know insurance is based on data isn't it, it it's uh, underwriting models require information and data and maths and it's sort of I, again from as a semi-outsider from the industry it seems that the industry is sort of blindfolded it's making guesses about the data and, and it looks at historic you know it needs to gather lots of data to make historic uh, you know analysis and then it says okay well this is the price this is the type of risk we're happy to cover and this is the price we're going to have to charge for it and it feels again very distant from the real data real-time data and information that brands and other companies have and or, or is trapped in other systems you know you, and you know you know iot internet of things sensors increasingly our you asked about the fourth industrial revolution our bodies will be giving off even more data than they do today in real time as well and we have this this information asymmetry today which is causing the industry which causes the industry to be very cautious quite rightly um but it's it also blindfolds the industry so i think as the world digitizes, more of our life is mediated by software, whether it's the metaverse and other types of digital technologies, sensors and so on. It's generating even more data. And if we can harness that, then we can create much better underwriting, new underwriting models and close that gap and make it, make it easier for insurers to, to price things that are attractive to them and make it attractive to end users as well. And maybe we don't have to have, you know, not only un, you know, pricing underwriting, but making claims processes much more, you know, efficient and quick and easy with a click, you know, just with your camera with a quick flash and so on. And, and, and as you know, because I know you, do, you, you look at all the latest, you know, best practices and we can talk about all kinds of innovations, but you know, the, I, some of, you know, if I, I crash my car, I photograph it, I get the offer there and then of, of it being getting a replacement car tomorrow in my drive. Uh, do I want to that accept? That type of process is, you know, it's, it, it covers all aspects of insurance and, and creates a better customer experience and so on. So we just scratch, I think we just scratch the surface of what's possible with this data. And so when, when I talk about embedded insurance, we're really talking about um, data right at the core. Um, data science, new data science skills, allowing us to capture data in new ways, which then helps us to then think about how we underwrite better. Also helps us to think about how we engage customers better using data to engage customers at just at the right moment in their lives when, they're, when this is something of importance. Um, and, and so data and digital technology, you know, they're one of the same things. The technology creates the data, the data makes the technology work better. And I think that's, that's our golden opportunity to really harness that. But as we've talked about, those skills are not in the core business. And those people who have those skills today don't want to work for insurers, you know, or banks, to be honest. They want to work for tech companies. So why don't we create our own tech companies? That's the answer. Let's, you know, as you said, let's create our own tech companies like Ping An did, not just you know, tr you know, try and fight against them. Let's create our own. And that's where the ambidextrous organization comes in because you can create the safe space for those to be created. So that's, that's, that tends to be how I see it. So every business is a tech business, whether it's insurance or whether in any other industry, and that will be a way for us to attract the talent of tomorrow. I think so. Yeah, I think yeah. So. And so looking at what you do, Simon, you know, we, we talk about corporate venturing, you actually help businesses identify the problem, find the solution, and also build the ventures of the future. When you look at insurance and what you are doing today, how far are we going into 
the venture build and changing our, not only the operating model, but the business model truly. Yeah, we're not doing it is the answer. I know, oh, oh it's tiny, it's tiny. We, so, so um, and again, this is a generalization, but most insurers have done, they've got a, most have a CVC, a corporate venture capital arm. And that's different to what we're talking about, corporate venturing, of course, that's, that's arm's length investment. It's completely different to creating new businesses that you, you know, new businesses for yourself that you control that could be bigger than your core business in the future. So CVC is, a really, I think it's a really good thing to do. You learn a lot from it, but it's, it's different to corporate venture building. And I don't see, with, with a few notable exceptions, the vast majority of insurers are not doing that in an industrial way. Um, or, they've, or they've set up units, but with very poor governance and that has fights against the core business or doesn't manage to leverage the, the, the assets that the core business has to create an unfair advantage. Uh, or they've replicated what some of the startups have done. They've created direct-to-consumer insure techs, which we know is really tough you know, world to be in for all the reasons you know, that, that we know. So, um, I, so I think there's a need for a re either a refresh or doing it from scratch, which is you know, for many, many um, uh, la very large insurers that really don't do this in an industrial or, 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 or consistent way. And, and there are some really great best practices now from other sectors that, that can be learned from. Um, and I think now is the time. I feel that uh, that's what I'm putting in my, I've got to produce a paper at the moment on, for incumbents uh, in, in this space. And, I, and this is what I'm saying. I think now is the time to do this properly. And it doesn't have to be, shouldn't be a big fanfare, no. you know, telling the world we're going to become like Ping An. Let's not, as we talked about, let's do it under the radar. You can do it quickly, cheaply and, and effectively. But there are some principles to put in place to, to make it be, a, be successful. Would you mind sharing maybe a couple of those principles so that when your paper comes out, everybody will go and run and yeah. get it? Yeah. So, so one thing is that the, it, the so we're going to create, we've got the core business, which is 99% of the business. We're going to create a separate space, but it is going to be governed by a very senior person who is not spending his or her time in the core business. So it's the CEO or the C or deputy CEO of a large organization. So they have the power. So they have power in the organization. They have great respect from the core, which is important because they've probably grown up from the core um, and they can, give the, they can give the air cover to the new business. So that's one, it needs to be governed and led by someone in significant power uh, that has a vision for the company overall and, and has an ambition, this is also important, that the company is going to break out of that, you know, the, the five percent, you know, incremental growth. You know, they're, they're, if you don't have that vision, you don't have that ambition. There's no, not much point in doing what I'm saying. But if you think, actually, there's big protection gaps. We've got lots of assets. Let's do something meaningful for the world and generate more value for ourselves. Then this makes sense. So one thing is the right type of sponsorship and governance. The second thing is that we need new metrics as well. So the metrics that are gonna be driving these ventures are different to the metrics that drive the, they're not combined ratio metrics. They're, they'll be, you know, as you know, so we different metrics. The third um, principle is that they, this activity is gonna be run by external entrepreneurs, uh, not by people who've spent 20 years in insurance. Possibly there may be, you know, an entrepreneur who could part, but not, let's keep, get people focused on what they're good at. We attract them by creating equity structures because otherwise they'll create their own insure tech businesses and they won't want to come up with they, they, These are proven people. They might have worked at, you know, some of the successful insure techs or digital companies and they, they want a new uh, adventure, but they want to de-risk it because, you know, the insurance company's got a lot of great assets they could take advantage of. So that's the other principle. And, uh, and then the third principle is that is that we are looking this is about creating profitable businesses it's not about burning huge amount of cash you know like the some of the startups that we've seen and so we're looking to create businesses that could be profitable to in three to five years so it's a mid-term you know return and at a certain time these businesses are going to be reincorporated into the core once they become mature it's like sending your child off to finishing school, you know, or something like that, you know, boarding school in the UK. I'm not, not that I'm recommending that, but, but you know, they, they, become, they, they become mature and then they're able to come back into the corporation when they're ready. But for now they're kept, kept separate. 
Um, and then finally, that's my final piece, is that it probably needs a different capital um, investment structure. So you don't want to run out of money. You don't want to sort of, when the core business is under pressure, you divert all the, cap, all the money away. And that's always often a, a threat. So maybe you create a partnership with a private equity company to joint fund these businesses. Maybe that's part of what you do. You create a different structure that can allow that. That's you know, Ping An did something like this as, as well. And these businesses, they can be reincorporated. They could be spun off, to, you know, and that then gives that flexibility. So I'd say those are probably the key principles. Very nice. You know, I think we have a um, lot of things in common in the sense that I, I believe a lot of this can be done with the corporate venture capitalist home, where you definitely need to be somebody at the edge and probably somebody who is very innovative. You absolutely need to change that incentive structure and introduce an equity-based uh, reward mechanism uh, because without that, people are going to leave. And the way you keep people is by giving them equity because then they have a, a reward for the long term. And then, yes, getting people from the outside, um, entrepreneurs, people thinking outside the box, People have tried different things and people have learned to use very scarce resources, you know, not wasting things, which we, I'm sorry to say, Simon, we do when we have been employee and we were able to travel, you know, business class. And we had really a lot of, you know, a lot of resources at our hand. And as you become an entrepreneur, you have to learn to use the resources, scarce resources, very, uh, very well. Mm. And then the last point you are, you are making, which is really key, as you spin off businesses, you need to feel comfortable that some will be uh, going into the big company, some will be spun off and sold to other company, and some will actually go into a longer path to success. However, you need to treat all your babies in some ways. I would say in equal ways, but you need to actually manage them as a portfolio and learning from failure as opportunity for for growth because no failure no one can grow without having their own failures in some ways exactly so looking at simon and looking at simon today from all the path you have gone through simon from telco to fintech to insurance what would you say to your younger self around where you are today and why it is the right path for you Ooh, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, I think I think it's the I think it's the noble cause. I think that's the key thing. You know, find a, find something where there's a, you know, there's there's a good commercial opportunity, but also you're doing good for the world. You know, and I and that's why, I, you know, when I get out of bed now and I think about insurance, I think about those protection gaps and the financial inclusion and financial wellness, and my mission is to try and do something about that and that's that's good I feel good about that so I think that's probably what I would say to my younger self um, is is to find something where there is a purpose that can motivate you um, beyond just earning a living purpose driven path mm. thank you Simon so if any one of our listeners want to find you and please talk as well about the the papers and the different uh, projects you've been working on so what can they do to find you or find the research you've been working on? Well, the best, the, well, LinkedIn is obviously the well, one of the best ways today. So I'm on LinkedIn and I post a lot there. So that's, that's the best way to follow or connect with me. And then secondly, my company is called, my, the, my URL is embedded-finance.io. So that's, that, that, again, you can get in touch directly that way, embedded-finance.io. But LinkedIn is obviously a very the easy way to do so. And do you want to tell us a little bit more about your recent research? Oh, uh, well, yes. Well, I've just, uh, it's my, my, again, I don't know if this comes out back to front on a, on a video. No, no, so, I, I've been in insurance. I see it. No, no. Oh, you see it? Good. Yeah, okay. So, absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So this, is a, this has been a labor of love for the last six months. So this is a benchmark of nearly 50 of the embedded insurance startups uh, around the world. And uh, we, we've looked at, you know, what they do and case studies and use cases and how they are acting as a catalyst for change in this industry so that's by it's just come out uh, very recently so that's been a great uh, labor of love recently um, and then we have I have the uh, report for the peer group on what incumbents need to do in this space and then coming up in the summer will be a report on um, super apps and how traditional companies can create can learn from the super apps of China and create their own super apps 
So, that's, so I'll be doing that over, over the summer as well. Thank you, Simon. And I want also to mention, and thank you very much, supporting us with our embedded heart paper, which I've produced mm. as well recently uh, with Care Voice and Sonar Global. And um, this paper just got released, and mm. we are so grateful for your reviews and helping us as well challenge some of the mindset in the health sector. So embedded is there to stay, right? And we are just scratching the surface, I know, right now. I think that's right, yeah. Thank you, Simon, for being with me today. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>